It's time for Talking Tauntaun! Your Star Wars source at AIPTcomics.com. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talking Tauntauns. I am Jim Lahane, and with me, as always, until she gets deported or exported to another continent, Nicole yeah. Herview. It me. Hello. Deported or exported. I'm not sure I, which way you're going. I'm definitely not getting deported because I was, you know, I'm, I, I'm here. Um, I would be exported or deported I, from Europe. It really depends. And with us, we have two special guests to talk the High Republic Phase 1 with us. First up is the wonderful massage therapist extraordinaire... <laughs> Independent book reviewer, Jedi scribe, and always looking to make a positive change and talking about the High Republic up on Twitter, Kai Charles. Hello. And also with us, you know her, you love her. She's from Stuff You Missed in History Class and Full of Sith and posted today that she has an empty void in her soul. <laughs> 750 billion years across. Yeah. It's dark in there. <laughs> it's Holly Fry. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Do you know when I tweeted that part of me was like, are people going to think I'm depressed and this is a cry for help? But no, that's just where the Halloween part comes from. It's fine. Yeah. It's totally fine. I, I screenshot it. I'm like, okay. I am so using that. <laughs> Good. <sighs> Fantastic. <clears throat> so, Kai, how are you doing? I am good. I'm in recovery mode from Comic-Con. So I'm illness-free, but so tired. And my body is done with the skip meals. So I'm like eating like food has been withheld from me. Like I've been on a desert island without food or water. It's my body <laughs> not having it. I'm eating like every hour. So <laughs> nice. It's, it, you, you add the extra meals back in and you're yes. like, yeah, I think it's time for a meal. I'm currently eating a meal. Okay, we'll just I was merge so them bad together. <laughs> I had red meat in like 10 years, and I was so hungry one day, and I was by the Bob's Burger uh, offsite, and they were giving out free burgers, and I didn't even check if, if it was beef or turkey. I just inhaled it in five seconds. And my body was like, at last. <laughs> um. Holly, how are you doing? You know, I have always been like that food aggressive dog that won't get adopted. So um, I understand where Kai's at right now. That's what I'm telling you. Um, don't don't put your hand near my dish so that I can tell you. <laughs> and I'm actually so jealous that she got to have a burger from the Bob's Burger pop up. That's like one of the few things that I was really like, oh, I'm missing it. It's San Diego. It was so the good. Bob's Burgers pop up was all I really cared about. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to comic con no i'm just going to the pop-up uh for the burger shack yeah <laughs> get a get a little snackaroo <laughs> fly back home <laughs> sounds worth it to me it's kinda the, yeah the priorities <laughs> are in order <laughs> yeah. and off air i'll tell you about the star trek ice cream i had after the burger yes oh wow no, i on like how star you just Wars like podcast? buried the lead <laughs> yeah <laughs> how dare no, that's great. I want to know everything. Okay. But we'll, we'll I, I hope it wasn't Dippin' Dots because uh, I, no, I have it was, anger issues with Dippin' Dots. It was Dots. the ice cream sandwich called the Wrath of Khan to celebrate <gasps> the 40th anniversary of the Wrath of Khan. It was, it was, it was the best. I just think about it now and I just like want to go back there. Yeah. I love everything about all of the words you just said. I can't even <laughs> deal with myself right now. Are you sure we have to talk about Star but, Wars? But, I think we do. Yes. We don't, this is now an maybe. ice cream podcast where we unpack why <laughs> Jim has some sort of issue with Dippin' Dots and really what Wrath of Pecan is and why the world has survived without it for so long. <laughs> no? Yes. No. <laughs> Correct. No. Approved. Approved. <laughs> Done. I will always talk about ice cream. I think we just launched a new podcast, but we'll there, workshop right. that later. Right. <laughs> figure out how to monetize this i was gonna uh, say that's that's the, the halcyon fund there you go mm -hmm. nicole how are you doing oh i'm great i'm in 
packing mode and, you know, still haven't seen another person in a week and a half just to make sure I don't get sick before I board a plane. Um, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, my cat is simultaneously tired of me and also saw the suitcase and now is just real mad and scared and frustrated with me. And, you know, I get it. <laughs> that's that's the default mode pretty much so yeah just just ready to ready to go ready to get out of america <laughs> me too <laughs> pretty much always <laughs> How are hey, you, where, are you, where are you going so i'm going to england and um taking a little baby weekend in disneyland paris as well oh, so the jealousy the yeah. jealous between the bob's burger situation and this i think you just invited me on to torture me you weasel i'm so sorry come with me i don't care let's okay. go um, listen don't dangle that carrot you don't even know. <laughs> come visit no I'm, I'm actually excited i realized like a month ago that they were opening avengers campus it just in time for me to go and i was like oh this is gonna be very bad for my wallet but fin fantastic for every other part of me <laughs> um but yeah i'm real i'm really excited i think you're gonna have fun i think so i'm not sure um i'm still being attacked <laughs> by my air conditioner by the way um yeah no it's it's gonna be something i i keep telling my friends i'm like i will be happy and comfortable and satisfied when we land in heathrow that's when i'll be happy mm -hmm. and i won't be happy until then and I probably won't be happy then because I'll be very, very jet lagged. But that's that's kind of the vibe right now. I'm stressed until I'm not, which is kind of every the day. <laughs> I'm usually anyway. like super stressed about a trip until I'm literally sitting on the plane. If I'm yeah. sitting on the plane, I'm generally OK. No mm -hmm. arrival. Arrival. Plus 12 hours is usually. Yeah. Where I'm at. Yeah. Because yeah, I've been in the plane and going to the runway. And then had the plane turn around, and oh, that, that we had to deep plane. I've had that happen more than once, so I'm that's not never actually happened to me. But I don't travel as it. much as a lot of people, so yeah, no, <laughs> not into that. That sucked. <laughs> so I just, you know, the anxiety that already exists in me is just like, let's multiply that. Let's keep it going. Let's fuel the fire. But but yeah. Well, speaking of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay, Jim? Are you good? <laughs> I think we need to talk about the High Republic. Okay, we're not going to talk I was talk working on my segues that. here. I did, did. <laughs> For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. I had initially proposed this as a um, live podcast episode with Holly and Kai at Star Wars Celebration. We were not um, accepted for the podcast stage for some reason. I don't How know. rude. I know, right? <laughs> and so, but I still wanted to do this. I, I wanted to do the uh, uh, basically a retrospective recap of phase one of the High Republic because, as we talked before the show, there was a lot. Um, <laughs> and it, I, I felt like it would be great to, to get a discussion kind of going before phase two kicks off in a few months. And so the words, thinking words, gotcha. um, <laughs> the, um, the High Republic was broken up into three waves where the first wave was released on January 2nd of 2020, I think, or 2021, 2021. I don't yes. know. Think twice. <laughs> I didn't know there would be a quiz. <laughs> time, time's not I don't know. real anyway. I, time, so. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm going. I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea how long anything's been going on. So about a year and a half ago, and we were immediately hit with an adult novel, a young adult novel, a middle grade novel, and two comic book series, and a children's book. With just stickers. Full, with, with stickers. I, 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 I have it. I, I've sent, uh, I've sent some to my friends because it has stickers. <laughs> love a sticker book. Yes, you, you can't complain. Um, and so yeah, I, uh, I was super excited about this. I, I, I remember we even had Holly on um, way back when they released the, uh, the like the first chapter or two of Light of the Jedi, and oh, we talked yeah. about that. Whoa. Like I for I forgot about that till just right now. 
<laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, same. I, well, in, back in those days, I remember thinking, this is so exciting. A whole new thing is launching and I can like consciously be aware of it from day one and just jump in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna absorb it into my soul and I'll know everything. I have had some challenges staying on top of all of the High Republic happenings. <laughs> My brain has forgotten some things by the time I get to another thing. I um, I will say this. I think a big part of this for me is the fact that one, I am largely an audiobook person. I do so much reading That's- for work work that I don't want to read more books in my leisure time, but I like will happily put one on in the car when I'm sewing or when I'm working on the house. Um, but I lost all that car time during the pandemic that I had been commuting. So I lost like a good six to eight hours a week that I was taking in books, um, which has slowed down my pace pretty considerably. But um, there is so much. And I think because I'm doing audio and not having as much visual, I'm realizing that I have a hard time tracking an entire new universe with a whole lot of new characters um, I, I need to, I feel like I need to do more study of visual components to keep everything in my brain and reiterate all of the, the various people, relationships, <laughs> et cetera. That's been the trickiest part for me to stay on top of it. So I noticed like we were immediately with the light of the Jedi, we were hit over the head with people. Oh yeah. Fast, fast paced chapters. A lot of action going on, a lot of people. And a lot of them actually carried on through a lot of the books. So it wasn't like wasted people. Uh, you do get a good background. Um, and so it, it was just a lot at once. And I uh, 100% understand, like, because I do all the audiobooks as well. And you're like, if you don't see the words, like for me, I'm a mm-hmm. visual learner. And so I, if I see a word, I generally can remember it pretty well. If I hear a word, I, being mostly deaf, I don't all, always pick up exactly like what that like name and stuff was. So I'll kind of everything kind of gets thrown into the the meat grinder at that point. Yeah. <laughs> There's also the repetition loss, right? Like when a new movie or TV show comes out, I will watch it four times, Mm -hmm. but it's not really tenable to listen to an audio book four times in a row. A 16 hour book. Yeah. (laughs) That's that's an investment. Yeah. Yeah. But Kai, I feel like keeps on top of it better than I do by a wide margin. What is your trick? What is your memory palace move? (laughs) I think it's because like I explained before we started recording, I read comics. And so the minute that I was able to see the, I was in Chicago when they had the Pro- Project Luminous panel where they told sent an hour with us and told us nothing, which was so amazing mm-hmm. because they were just because I knew um, both Charles and Justina from other books. So having that anchor with them and then meeting these other three authors. But I think it's because of my comic background. And the minute they described it as multi-platform and all the content, I knew that I was just going to have to consume it all. Um, I think we have to mention there is a kind of privilege of having the money to do that. Like, oh, yeah. um, yes. as I'm sharing, I, I, I am on the review list for some Star Wars books, but that hasn't always been the case. And I kind of do a one in one. If I get a cop book for review, I still if, if there's a variant cover, I will buy the book or I'll buy another book from the author. But it's a lot of content and it's very ambitious and it's very well synced together. Like if you can consume everything as it comes out, it's these amazing puzzle pieces of things that just fit wonderfully together. And, or you can just take one track. I know some people who are just like, I don't read middle grade. And then they get upset when there's some information. (laughs) Well, why should I have to read that to, and you know, I I said to someone, well, multi-platform story got a multi-platform, you know, like that's- You gotta make the other platforms worthwhile. Right, but then I was very easily course corrected in a group I belong to, it's really great, where they mention European fans and there's some of that lack because of delays and things not being released simultaneously. So, um, but it takes a lot of commitment. It takes a financial commitment. And also I think it's just having that time and I have a lot of time to do it. It also is a lot of content. My greatest joy now is seeing that phase one is, op- is over 
and we're waiting for phase two, all of these people are now finding the high republic because they feel like there's less and pressure on. And you have more time to catch you have up. More time and yeah, all these, yeah. and it's really fun because I always do this thing like we got another one because it's a very small percentage of people who have the time and financial commitment to do all of these things. But the library is great. And when I tell people like, people like, I don't know if I like a middle grade. I'm like, there's this thing called the library. <laughs> like, what? And if you don't like it, then you don't buy it. But if you do love it, you go buy it. So yeah, there's some, but also too, I just read pretty fast. And I also have to say, reading something where you see yourself being seen mm -hmm. makes you commit the time. I think there's, I've never seen this level of representation for myself. And I've been, I'm older than Star Wars. I've been here since the beginning. And so I feel like I'm hungry for it. Like I won't skip a week at a comic shop if a High Republic comic is coming out. If it's not a High Republic comic, oh, maybe I'll go in two or three weeks. They know I'll show up. But like, you have to read it the day it comes out so you can discuss it and keep up with High Republic community and not get spoiled. So I just recommend everyone do it at their own pace and just don't be overwhelmed. I think there's also a semi a semi issue, um, kind of what you were saying about. I think it was it Europe's not just not getting the comics, or are they also having issues with the books. I think there's delays because there's a publishing shortage, and then also the way that Disney decided to not go with. Um, IDW anymore kind of left a gap where people did where the second half of Star Wars Adventures was very um, people didn't even know if it was going to be reprinted. It was hard for your people, your people, European people to get it. And it's pretty much required reading to read all of that before you read Midnight Horizon. Yes. So, uh, no, I, was, I, uh, I understand. Agree. That was my yes. my review in a nutshell is if you aren't reading the comics, the book misses a lot. <laughs> right. Like you have to read the second phase of Daniel's High Republic Adventures and Trail of Shadows mm -hmm. before going into Midnight Horizon. And for some European people, like it wasn't. I was at Comic-Con and I swear Comic-Con became like High Republic Con for me because I was interviewing all these people and I was just like, by the way, are you going to make some High Republic merchandise? And I was walking uh, back to my hotel and there was this woman at the train stop with her husband and he said, I got a surprise for you. And he pulled out High Republic comic volume two, the comic collector. She's like, oh my God, I haven't been able to find this anywhere. And she was like, literally like kissing her husband on the street. So there is a hard time. People are having a hard time finding collections and not everyone yeah. does digital comics. And even if you do digital comics like Comixology, there's no guarantee that European release dates will be the same. Right. So some European fans, they've been feeling really slighted because we live in spoiler comics culture now you can't people just can't seem to keep things quiet so that's been a problem now the um i i understand the issue like the comics especially the comics in this series because like you have of the two major villains in the series you have the nile and you have the drain gear the drain gear were introduced in the young adult novel and then they disappeared unless you read the comics yep M much to my chagrin it's probably the one thing I was most excited about in the High Republic. <laughs> because yeah, they're so very cool. Lovecraftian, right? They yes. harken back to a yes. lot of really old school um, kind of atmospheric horror that I grew up loving. And so that felt very much like I was like, oh, this is my in. This is how I'm going to connect all the dots is how they interact with the Drangir. And then it was like, goodbye, my loves. Like they just <laughs> were suddenly not in the mix so much you have anymore. Kevin's run because Kevin's all about that hammer horror kind of mm -hmm. feel. So mm -hmm. dark comics. And when they just see humans and they say meat, it's like the, the <laughs> Yes, that is so uh, that is up my alley in seven flavors. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it brings up a good a good point and kind of my issue with the whole thing is that the quality of the work from the creative side is unbelievable like across the board everything i've read has been like so worth the time and so worth the energy and so worth the effort and the investment and yet it's just impossible to consume it all for most people and it's just like i've never talked about this on the show but i have adhd and find it really really difficult to sit down and read a book all the way through 
And as a writer, I need to read a lot of stuff. And I can't just read Star Wars. So if, you know, my reading hours are taken up just by, you know, the, basically, it's a very me problem. But you kind of have to do that personal accounting. And I think everyone kind of has a version of that. And the fact that you're missing out, not just on like interesting content, but really good, high quality content that's all interwoven and structured so beautifully. Like these, these writers... This writer's room, I, oh my God, would I, I, I'd give up a lot of stuff to be just a fly on the wall in it and just see that process because all of these pieces, like you said, Kai, like fit together so beautifully and it's so impressive. And I just wish I had a sec, I guess we have a second now to breathe, right? Which is great. But as things were coming out, I feel like I've kind of lost track about what I was supposed to be reading and when and where it is Mm -hmm. and in what form and who wrote it and what's going on and who are the artists working on it. And all of that is just kind of like, I need a manual, like my kingdom for a character chart. Like, just give me like a family tree of the High Republic. (laughs) Like, just who is where and when and why and what's going on. Star Wars. Tom has come to the rescue because oh, this yes, <laughs> the phase two High Republic show with Christine. But StarWars.com, as of today, you can go there and there is a reading order for High Republic that includes everything. And mm. I think, too, they maybe hadn't done this initially because it was locked down and there were problems. And even with comics now, there's printer problems where comics are not showing up. Um, there was a really great site called Utini, who was kind of the first to say, "Here's the order you read." But that's the most—that's the most asked question I see about High Republic. Where do I start? You know, and so mm-hmm. lots of people, you know, the community loves helping and answering questions. And you know, I always get a text like, "Okay, I'm finally starting High Republic. Where do I start?" And it is good to know that all roads go with Light of the Jedi. So just start there. Just start with Light yeah. of the Jedi. But yeah, now at StarWars.com, if you go, there's a great, they even add all the comics, all the, the even the children's book with stickers. So um, it's a good time to check that before we get into phase two, because it is a little overwhelming. Yeah, that's a great resource. Good shout, mm-hmm. for sure. I feel like the children's book with stickers sounds like a joke. Like, yeah, not, you should get not a joke. Well, that's a, <laughs> you like you should get the children's book because it has stickers. No, that children's book gives you visual reference for the major events in the yeah. adult novels. It, they are ab- absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I think yeah. for me, as there's brown people in this and when I saw the book with stickers, like I like it's real. I could see yeah. it on merchandise so like yeah i never thank you for calling on that it wasn't meant as a joke but no no but it's the way other people would take it it's like it's a sticker book why why would i buy it no but like these are they're illustrated children's books is essentially what they are creators like (laughs) phil noto he basically amazing started they came to him with the pitch and he was the one that kind of laid the foundation of what this would look like and the writers really took to that and but the first time I saw Belle in that sticker book with Ember, I like cried, like just to see just the little hallmark touches of, you know, there is colorism and the fact that Belle is a dark skinned black character means just as much as Keeve having her faces of natural hair, you know, like, like her, just her hair changing as she goes on her journey and um, just the, the care it took makes me think it's, pretty much possible to do this everywhere people just need to take the time and the initiative so it's definitely raised my bar of what i expect not only of star wars going forward but everything i feel like some of that and also how well it interacts all of the pieces and you probably can speak to this better than i can kai is the fact that we talked about nicole mentioned the writer's room being amazing i feel like those writers are such an amazing cohesive squad they can have discussions about issues like that and Mm -hmm. really bolster each other's work, inform each other's work. And the whole thing just gets better and better and bigger and bigger. It doesn't, it's never like a thing of, yeah, but that's not my experience. I don't know how to write that. Like they're sharing at a level that you wish every collaborator could do. That's I think we should mention, um, we didn't mention it yet. So the, the, five principal authors for the high republic at least for phase one because i know phase two they're adding in a bunch of uh, new authors uh we have kevin scott charles soul or sewell never know how to pronounce his last name um, i think it's 
just said it's soul, like soul. Mm-hmm. I thought it was soul. Uh, Daniel Jose Older, Justina Ireland, and Claudia Gray. And, and they definitely, they picked like a fantastic array of authors that really fit into their, their niches very well. It's the I think fellowship of the I, Star Wars. It's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. My- Glane really needs to be added to that list because he is just oh, yeah. kind of the first I mean no you he's the head of it but also you could tell the caretaking he took with bringing these authors together and you know if you follow them all on Twitter like they've become just a family and they they've shared it they talk every day you know they have a special slack that they talk in so it really comes through in the work yeah it really does and then you could add like Christina Ariel into that as well as the uh, kind of the that really the cheerleader of the High Republic, but gets the content out more so because the authors are authoring, um, and Lucasfilm is kind of doing um, it's like managing. But you need that social media cheerleader, and she's been doing like a yeah. fantastic job at doing that too. And her recaps are fire. Like if you don't mind having some stuff spoiled, and you just want to like find out where things are she will recap in seven minutes and they do these uh animation animatronics with it like she will catch you up in seven minutes that girl can talk so fast and she's so funny (laughs) and she's she's just amazing she's a delight and very good at her job she's the conduit for the rest of us like she is the Mm -hmm. connector between the fan base and sometimes if we feel lost in the morass of high republic uh, yes. She's got the direct ear and the direct contact with the people that are making it, but also clearly loves it herself. So like, she's like our, our little Sherpa of the whole thing. She's our guide. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, like you were saying about the, the um, recaps, uh, I just was watching the newest one that got released like yesterday, a couple days ago. I'm not sure mm-hmm. exactly. Um, and it recapped the entire phase one in three minutes. And I'm like, Oh, okay, yeah, that, that, that pretty much like is a good reminder. Um, but as I was saying even before the, we recorded, is that we have this whole phase one. Phase two is a prequel. Like we're starting at 200 years before any of the movies. The prequel, the next phase, which starts in November, is going to be 150 years further back. So you're looking at 350 years before the movies. We're not getting the sequel to this um, this phase two until like probably another year and a half out. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's these recaps are going to be more and more valuable <laughs> to those yeah, of us yeah. who don't want to spend 16 hours, 32 hours, 45, 50 hours re- mm-hmm. rereading the books. There are some touchstones. So one of the great things about phase one is there's some long lived characters. So the touchstone to kind of remind you will be they will be in phase two, but younger versions of them, like the Blade of Barada, Yoda, of course. Um, Maz is going to be a big part and Daniel's run with the new characters. So they are going to give us those touchstones to kind of remember. And I'm sure he may, there may be a little... um, I don't know about Skier, if Skier is long lived enough, but I think there's going to be some really good touchstones to help us remember some of phase one. It's just an egg. That's Skier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I know the because the blade has been announced, the blade of Rada, and he, you know, we see well, him he, in phase he... one as a gentle man who likes to bake, you know, and, and enjoys a good drink with his baked goods and, so now Charles is about to flip our mind and show us who he was earlier in his career. Why he's called the Blade of Barada. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thought he just liked cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that's what it was. <laughs> I think um, that brings up an interesting thing that I have really liked. And I was they started to announce phase two, I got sort of more excited about it. What I have loved the most, aside from the drain gear, is... Um, the high republic really shows us jedi who are not sure of themselves and are really like mentally duking it out with what their life choices are what their career is what it means to have their identity and their job essentially be the same exact thing and to me that's like the exciting part right is that internal conflict and i feel like getting back to see the seeds of like where people came in maybe a little more naive or idealistic before they become a person who's like, please just let me bake 
and have a cocktail now and again. Uh, like that's a, to me a really interesting inroad psychologically to the whole thing. Yeah, it, it also makes me wonder, besides just the intrigue of that, were the Jedi ever what they were supposed to be, ideally? Because that's kind of how this whole series, at least for me in my perception, was kind of pitched. Like, let's see the Jedi as they were meant to be, as they were supposed to be, because we've only ever seen the Jedi Order, you know, in like the prequel era, really falling apart, kind of like they've lost their way completely. There's very few of them who still kind of follow the quote unquote rules of the Jedi as we would ideally see them. And even here, even in the higher public, the answer is no, they're not. They're not really what, quote unquote, the Jedi are supposed to be. And that's OK. I just find it interesting. Like, what were they ever like? Did that ever happen? Like, is the idea of the Jedi that's in people's head real at all? Or was it just never a possibility? It's so interesting to me as, you know, just a lifelong Star Wars fan to be like, have the Jedi just been idealized the whole time? And that kind of flips a lot of things on its head. I'm fascinated by Yoda because how Yoda got, which I think parallels religion a little bit, how this younger Yoda, and we're going to see even a younger one who's a journeyman, how he, after everything he witnessed, how he became, let the order get so rigid. Mm. Almost like he didn't, he had to step back when you're, when you're almost immortal. When does the time come when you just have to step back and let people do what they're going to do? Because we see this Yoda that let Padawans leave to explore themselves, like leave the order as happened with Cantum, and then come back. And um, you see him understanding relationships and understanding things. And how does that get to the Yoda of the prequel era who has just let this rigidity sink into the depths of the Jedi order? And I think the only one that could ever really live up to the Jedi was Obi-Wan. Like he's the only one that was able to cut off portions of his heart to stay. And even at his lowest, he still found faith in the order. I think it's an impossible set of standards to set people to. Mm -hmm. I agree. The Jedi order is like, I think it makes sense that everybody's kind of questioning themselves. Cause like we all, we question ourselves about pretty much our entire lives. Like, is this what I should be doing? Like, um, and it reminds me kind of like the Amish, uh, where um, when Amish reach um, almost adulthood, kind of late um, late teenage years, they are essentially set free and allowed to do what they want. And more often than not, they just discover that the world is a flaming cesspool and they go back to the live with the Amish. And it's it's similar here. Like the Jedi are they, they're raised in the order what do you want to do? Do you want to stay here? And they're all questioning this. And eventually you kind of hit that mid twenties when you kind of like, okay, I think I know what I want to do with my life and kind of recourse evaluate. Although I'm in my forties and I still don't know what I want to do with my life. As I uh, you literally need your bought own, a farm you last need a year. Midlife from Springer is what you're telling <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, I, like, I literally bought a farm in my, uh, like my forties. Um, so I don't know what I'm <laughs> This makes me think of, yeah, this is going to sound crazy, but come along with me. Uh, William Blake, right? There's a Blakean uh, ideology where he always, in his writing, made clear that you could not be truly good until you understood evil and you had seen darkness. And I think that's kind of it, right? If you're a Jedi and you have been raised as a Padawan in the temple and everything is sort of that very, like, structured, super supported you know, learning about the force, being in touch with the force, but you've never really been out tetherless in the the galaxy. To then go do that for a minute makes you understand more deeply the lessons you've had your entire youth. I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. That makes a lot of sense. Like, cause uh, like being a parent myself, it's like you try to raise them right, mm -hmm. but they don't understand what you're doing you've been out there they haven't they just think that you're an a-hole um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're so confident when we're younger right like Ugh. i remember me at like fearless it's ridiculous like i remember a few years ago my parents stumbled upon like a home movie from like 
Christmas when I was in high school. And I was like, I don't like that person. <laughs> like, I don't like anything about her. She stinks. Like, she thinks she knows absolutely everything. And then, like, once you actually reach, like, adulthood, and I'm double that age now, you're like, wow, you sweet summer child. Like, it's that's absolutely it. You kind of need that, like, moment. For me, it was, like, going off to college and being by myself and, like, seeing the actual world a little bit. And it's interesting to, like, have a Jedi equivalent, you know? It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> they, they went off to school for a little bit and figured it out real quick. But, yeah, it's like, I think people need that, need that kind of wake up in some form. So, yeah, yeah. it definitely makes sense. Yeah, and it was interesting, like, when I was reading the first wave, that feeling of kind of, like, because of listening to Holly's amazing podcast with her partner, stuff you miss in history I look at things differently and it was so interesting in phase one it's this kind of like hubris where the Jedi are like we're just gonna come help you guys we're gonna build this big star city and I was like is this conversation it's it's a little like it's a little like you I mean you guys are so sweet but it's also and I feel like I am so fascinated by the Nile like I don't even consider them true villains because it's like a point of view right and it's so fascinating because it's just like We have been here. We've been keeping our kind of order. The hubris of you to just say, you're going to come here with your big shiny space station and like bring law and order. Like who invited you? Like who who invited you to do that? And I just, it was just funny having those thoughts and still wanting to support them and loving them all and loving their sweet summer child, like looks at the galaxy. But I just thought it was very fascinating that are the Nile wrong? Like, are they right? No, are they are they true villains you know well that's the best villains are always ones that you can be sympathetic with mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah like yeah. well and uh, i was just gonna say the jedi kind of become the flag bearers of the galactic version of they meant well <laughs> yeah 100 <laughs> percent. yes <laughs> But uh, Jim, I want to. I want you to keep going with your thought of the Nile I, not I really don't know. being you, you, clear villain. Oh, you just completely derailed me with they meant well. The so. bash. Bless their hearts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the Nile structure makes more sense to me than like the Empire. Like I've always said, who on earth would ever want a job with the Empire? Like you rise through the ranks to get choked by your boss. But with this, you might also get choked by your boss, but it works a little like a multi-level marketing program. But like everybody gets a little bit of agency and you can use that agency to prove yourself and be recognized and get promoted based for the most part on merit. There's obviously some literal and figurative backstabbing, but um, like I can understand why someone in a desperate situation would find themselves in that and be like, you know what, this actually is a great expression of like how I can possibly make a better life for myself somehow. Live on the streets or be supported in a quote, quote family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I'm just seeing the Nile trying to sell crappy leggings now. Like that's oh, it's just <laughs> LuLaRoe in space. Like that's it. <laughs> and it's, I, I wouldn't say that they could get choked by their superiors. I'm worried about the people underneath. Right, like it's the the people with a little more uh, drive than you have that you got to worry about. Well, that's where the merit comes in, really. My, I I all listen to Tempest Runner. Yes, yes, that is peak. Not only as a woman did I identify with that, like just like I was, I was literally cleaning while there's a penultimate moment where you realize the Nile is about choice, which I find really fascinating because there comes a time for each Nile where they make the choice to join that it's committed to blood to death and i was like cleaning and listening and i'm like no lorna don't do it don't do it lorna (laughs) and then she does it and that to me is the thing with the nile like i just love they're not straight they're a product of their circumstances Mm -hmm. and the jedi never think about the boots on ground 99 percenters they they've never had to because they're looking at higher higher plane but people who need to eat and worry about security have to make different choices. Um, and that's a great thing in the the Life Day special where Kevin writes a story with St- Kevin. I think he did it with a partner or it was just Kevin, where Stellan ends up in the lower levels and he sees what life is really like because, you know, Stellan is always has to be fancy and always has to wear his gold 
because he takes Jedi as a job. So you always wear your suit. And, and just him seeing what life is like for other people. And even though he changes the fortunes of one family, there's still millions of families he can't ever save or protect. I think George Mann may have co-authored. Yeah. yeah, George Mann actually, um, interestingly enough, interestingly enough um, is becoming an author on Phase 2, but he has the first story released in The High Republic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's in uh, the dark, dark, dark tales or something like dark, that. Yeah, uh, it's either dark tales or dark legends. Yeah, dark. Yeah, dark legends. Like he had a, a Dringier story like a couple months before Light of the Jedi. And I'm reading it. Yeah. I'm like, this sounds an awful lot of like they're discussing that's coming in the High Republic. Exactly. And, uh, and if you listen to Juku Jedi Lost, he talks something about the tragedy of Master um, Trennis. And we're all like, is that Keeb? <laughs> is that another Master Trinus? Like, yeah. what are you doing to his cabin? So that will be revealed at some point. <laughs> Theoretically. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in that. The, they like to give you a lot of questions, the High Republic, but you also kind of get answers. So I like answers. And I'm, I'm not a big mystery box fan unless you give me the answers later. J.J. Abrams, not your uh, <laughs> the mystery box it used to be, but now, like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of done. <laughs> <laughs> of the promise of The Force Awakens, and I will always cleave to the promise of The Force Awakens, mm -hmm. a film I will watch over and over. And, uh... yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have The High Republic, brand new initiative, uh, comes out, has the three waves, has three adult novels, um, started off with a literal explosion, um, ships crashing, fire, f flames raining down, ends with space stations crashing, flames, fire raining down. Um, what was, like, if you had one, I really liked this story, um, what would you go to, uh, Kai? Oh, you're going to pick on me. I'm going to say The Rising Storm, because I think... Um, there's a story going around that George R. R. Martin, when he found that everyone was going to cleaving to Rob and making everyone feel like everything was going to be okay because Rob was going to step up. And he decided that Rob had to die. And I think the, the rising storm is that book where things get real. Like we, we real we really realize the threat of what we're dealing with. You know, it's, it just, I mean, the, the, the way, your heart just kind of gets ripped out, but you enjoy it because you're enjoying the art of it and how it's done. But to me, I think Rising Storm will always be that book, that book that we learned where we were going. So the and Rising gonna... Storm, yeah, the the second adult novel where we have the um, the the Repu the attack on the Republic Fair. So yes. Sky, uh, we 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 did lose some people. I feel like they pulled back with the Chancellor. Uh, I feel like that she should have died, but. <laughs> well, then Claudia Gray said, oh, this is what we're doing. Hold my blue milk and gave us the fallen star. Oh, my word. <laughs> not from. I just say that in my, I say the word, the fallen star in my heart goes, oh, okay. I still got some processing to do. <laughs> uh, Nicole, what would. Uh... If I have to pick one, one book or one installment. I'm going to say Fallen Star because I am emo as hell and I just thought it was the perfect amount of misery and pain and I I, love, I thought it was art. I thought it was great. Um, yeah, and it, it's just unbelievable. But a storyline, the whole Drengear arc is unreal to me. I thought it was so cool. As Holly said, very Lovecraftian. Very, like, that is visceral horror that mm -hmm. I haven't seen on a page in a minute and like it just made me feel all the things I was supposed to feel so I thought that whole storyline was executed with such finesse which is you know my favorite word lately but yeah I just thought it was great and just so scary in a way I didn't think a plant could get me I was like little shop of horrors what and then just about it was to say actually that. scary <laughs> like it was actually terrifying I was like not enough great. singing not enough singing, but just un unbelievable horror 
fodder. I thought it was great. They ended it in such a way that they basically put the Dranger on a shelf. And so there's always the hope that it can come back. They're still out there. <laughs> I'm waiting. It's in, waiting. It's, it's in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> the creepiness of like the people like in the manga were the person that brought the seeds to the planet knowing mm-hmm. that it was like that's insidious too that you have these evil things but then you have humans that are collaborating and they don't care if they die as long as they meet the initiative of destroying what they want to destroy with them yeah. that's yeah. You, you also have humans that are just plain dumb <laughs> it's also true <laughs> listen Holly. you don't have to put me on blast right here i know i do a lot of stupid stuff do you know? <laughs> <laughs> i didn't Jeez. say you Jeez. <laughs> I apologize for him. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, what what's what would you pick? This one might surprise you because I have championed all of that horror and whatnot. But honestly, for some of the reasons that Kai mentioned, uh, Tempest Runner, I think, was the one I connected the most with. Part of that is too because we're getting information about Ryloth that we've never had before. Like this idea of these sort of outpost communities on the moons of Ryloth that have their own governments and they're in conflict with the greater Rylothian people. All of that was really interesting to me. And I really did like exactly what she was saying where you're watching Lorna get to this point where she makes her choice. And even though you're going, girl, don't do it, please don't do it. You also completely understand why she does it. Um, and can recognize for me, I mean, that's sort of the thing we're all doing every day, right? When we choose to theoretically not be monsters in our day-to-day life is that you can understand how you could get to that point and make that choice. And you would hope in the same position that you wouldn't, but you can't help but have empathy for someone that's that's standing at that precipice and decides to jump instead of turn away. Um, so to me, that's always very interesting. I also just like that that at that point, Lorna D had been built up as really just vicious, a monster, and terrifying, and just completely. At that point, you're like, this does this person have any moral core? Do they have any kind of redeeming qualities and you get to see that like no there has been a softness in her that got exploited and you know it it just makes it a little bit more it's that same thing where like you said earlier the best villains are the ones where it's not entirely black and white in terms of them being bad or good when you can see that there is actually i mean it's the same thing that made darth vader compelling right like there is good even in the darkest person that makes it almost more painful to watch them be cruel because you know that there's some part of themselves that they're tamping down to be able to do that. And that's, that's a good stuff. I feel like they did that with a lot of like for the Nile in general, over this entire series, we didn't get much on them until much, much later. Like I think Tempest Runner really was the first delving because Lorna D we had almost nothing on her. All we knew is that she was a monster. Pointy um, toothed and vicious. That's what yeah, we... <laughs> that's, a, that's literally all we got. And then you get Tempest Runner, and you get her backstory, mm-hmm. and it's a heartbreaking backstory, like betrayal, and like, like pretty much you're looking at her and going, "Yeah, I'd be in the same boat as you. Like, it, you're you're not doing anything that isn't understandable." Right. I wish you had a therapist so you didn't have to kill to work through your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But then also at Lorna's story, there's hope at the end because, uh-huh. because her one action with someone that got close to her, you leave feeling like hopeful, like can something else maybe get to her in the future? And yeah. um, and I, I commend Kevin Scott because I he's been speaking more about not only with Keeve and Skier, but the thoughtfulness, the way that he kind of un- found a way to channel what it feels like a woman to constantly be being used and bartered and and even when she starts to make the change she realizes her change is not about her but it's someone trying to say check off on a mark I did this I made her good right and she starts to look at what has she ever done that has just been just for herself and I just think that he just has an enormous capacity to understand women and all his female characters in the high republic are wonderfully whether they're ones he created or the ones he caretakes. There's just a lot of caretaking going on among these five people. And they are really thinking about things and talking about things. And 
talking about, do we want this to look like this? How do we want this woman to be represented? It's just like a comforty place to be. It's also a breath of fresh air, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think any of us are used to seeing that level of multidimensionality at every single turn for characters that are not, uh, you know, uh, white guys who are heroes. <laughs> So I would say if I if I had to pick mine, um, I'm going to lean towards something that you guys didn't pick just to just just to be a little different. Like there, there's so much in this series that I have absolutely loved. There's other stuff that has been not for me, but I, I've been loving so much of it. I'd have to say, like, out of the shadows um, yeah. because it, it was Justina Ireland's um, I think her young adult novel. I think that's the only young adult one she may have done. Um mm-hmm. It, it just like it made a major plot point um, by killing off like the prime source of the Nile's power, put it in the young adult novel. They didn't really care um, that it wasn't in the main adult novel series. And it was such a compelling story on top of all that. And I, I, I really, I loved all the characters and I loved the story that they were doing. And it's, um, it really made me a fan of uh, Justina Ireland's work. Like everything that she's done in the series has been, uh, I- I've absolutely loved it. But uh, um, I think that was that was the best that uh, that she did for the series. Yeah, Chansey is amazing, and I just love how um, Chansey Yarrow just goes through making all these comments like about wealth and about how people don't realize the different levels of um, life that happens, you know. And and she's just her snarkiness was the best. It was it was just a fun book, and I I, I like mm-hmm. like um, Claudia Gray's both Cla- Claudia Gray's an absolutely fantastic author. Um, everything that she touches has been gold. Um, it's really disheartening <laughs> as someone who wants to try to write a book. It's like I'll never be that good. <laughs> Pick up her Wickham book and feel really depressed because she can. Well, write I, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's right there, and I'm very excited i'm reading pride and prejudice just as a re a reread and then i'm gonna read that and i'm so excited like that's our boy reef which like i have never been more seen in the galaxy than being like yeah i would be a jedi but i'd be the one that wants to stay in the library (laughs) you know i'm like i want i want the sword i want the swagger but please can i just hang out can i just be that version of jacosta new like 200 years ago that's just all I want. And he just, his journey is amazing. And I like cried at his arc in Midnight Horizon and how these authors can like, they don't take, they take ownership of some characters. Like you can ask them like, where was that? And they'll be like, well, that was kind of mine, but how she could give us Reef, And then Daniel can give us what I call peak Reef, which is building on what Claudia did, building on what happens to him and the second wave of phase one and then bringing him to a culmination in Midnight Horizon that is just so satisfying and like the one good thing that you can feel joy about after Fallen Star. <laughs> You're like, this is this is a good way to end this on joy. <laughs> I think one of my biggest criticisms um, that I had overall as a series is that of all the characters, we got huge diversity of characters the main adult novels still ended up being almost primarily led by two white guys. Yeah. Right. Well, Elzar isn't, if you're talking about Elzar, because Elzar isn't white. First oh, he all. isn't? He isn't white. It's um, people are really trying to call this out because they're seeing some things on casting choices. If you look closely at Phil Noto's uh, drawings, he is brownish. So you oh. kind of, yeah. Cause I, I always knew that, you know, like, people of color we can spot there there are there's our people (laughs) there's our people and uh someone called this out because they were doing uh, fan casting people like please stop picking white dudes for elzar man so if you look closely at the cover um but yeah but that i think a lot of people have kind of thought that defaultly but um well the pictures i saw he looked white um, and so thank you for calling that yeah, out. It, that's, that's a real good <laughs> show. Light of the Jedi, you can kind of see a little tent on that cover. I'm not sure that they've kept it consistent. Right. Mm. Um, mm. But I, day one, I was like, oh, he's brown. And then I went online and was talking to other people. They're like, yeah, he's brown. So we think he's brown. We could be wrong. So. 
No, I, I will right. say this, Jim, which might have informed that thinking, uh, because I initially had it too, until I think Kai had replied to somebody and I followed the thread back up and I was like, oh, if you like me are watching, uh, are consuming it digital, the blowout on a screen takes away some of that tint. It was not until I actually sought out a print copy that I was like, oh, this actually yeah. looks different than and I look thought. At, yeah. Look at Bill, yes. look at all the my copies art. are digital. Yeah, if you go to the highrepublic.com where they have all those kind of trading card like things with the that they release new ones, yeah. That's oh, well, good you to know. have completely decimated my criticism and no, do but it you could have for good. Uh, but I it's don't good. think so. Because <laughs> Stellan, Stellan's real front and center. Yeah, because it, it is Stellan. It, Stellan is front and center. And, and uh, but go ahead with your comment because let's just oh, say oh, two guys versus there being two guys. Okay. Well, it's yeah. just, like you had Avar Chris and she gets plucked out of the books. Like she is like in leader of Starlight Beacon, which is the major thing. And she's not in the Rising Storm. She's not in the Fallen Star. Like, I think she may have been like two pages max on the whole thing. And like you had her, you made her. Why? Like, I understand that they wanted her for the comics, but like it. Like personally, me, I love I love the more diversity you can give me, the the happier I am. I do not need um random dudes just showing up. <laughs> and it, it feels like like I wish she was in more of it. Like I love where they ended her in the comics because I felt like she had a very downward spiral that matched Elzar's downward spiral. And I think them as a couple um really worked great uh because even though they're apart they're spiraling together <laughs> um, True. and i think maybe if in foresight they looking back if they would have said avar's adventures continue like something at the end of the book might have helped people i personally think that everyone is in love with how charles describes avar she is like one of those just how she hears the force, the level of empathy she has. We want more of what we get in Charles's book of her. And Kevin does an amazing job with her. And if you read Light of the Jedi and then read the entire comic series, you enjoy it. But I think people are craving book Avar, like they're craving. Yeah. Yes. And that, so if there could have been a way to maybe prepare fans to say Avar's adventures continue in the High Republic comics, but I've heard that a lot of people who are just reading the adult novels, they're feeling like she got shafted. And I'm just kind of like, well, no, really. Um, so, but I also love, cause Elzar is a messy man and I do not like messy men. I just have to tell you, it's just not my wheelhouse, but watching, like I have been fascinated by having him and Stella in front and center because I think it's an opportunity to show some emotions in men we don't get in fiction. Mm. And Elzar is just like, he's so messy. And it's just, I, <laughs> and I feel for women who love messy men because those are their people, you know? But Hello. like, I always say Elzar is that kind of guy who says at the first date, I love you, I what, marry me. You're like, can I have 48 hours to think about it? And in those 48 hours, he takes your best friend out on a date and gets her pregnant. So like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if I had a nickel. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's so messy. And I did not know that I would find like some some kind of um, it would be quite a journey to watch him to go through. And I am now fully invested in his messiness. I want him to have like a happy ending. But I just was like, why are you giving me this messiness, High Republic? And so yeah, I, I'm really trying to get people who love Avar to read the comics, but just know that it's a different Avar, and she she still is amazing. She has a really good arc with Keith, but I think fundamentally people are craving that Avar that we had in Light of the Jedi. Yeah, yeah, Kai, we're different people because I I I love I love messy men, and that's my problem. <laughs> like that's why it's me in an apartment with a cat. That's why, we're, and I'm going to Disney World for my 30th birthday with my mom. That's that's why we're here, where we are. And I'm thrilled with it, but that's it's but the love, Elzars of this world. Love them. Everyone deserves love. I oh I, yeah. I appreciate the women that love the messy men, but I'm just like yeah. no. 
<laughs> stronger person than me. Be gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think they did a fascinating job with Elzar and Stellan because you have two very, very different people um, kind of playing off each other. It, it, I think they did a great job. I just kind of was one of those like, but you could also like throw Avar in or something like or have another character entirely. Like, it, like mm-hmm. it, it doesn't need to just be the Elzar and... um um. Stellan show. Stellan yeah. uh, words. There you go. You got it. <laughs> I know all the words. Yes. It is hard with characters. The biggest complaint I've heard of people, there's a lot of characters. And I said, I know, just make a list, do what you need to do. It, But it is a lot of characters. And that's, um, it's kind of hard to remember. And that's, again, where that, that children's book has been like really helpful. Because now I have an image of Belle. I have an image of, Burry and the comics have helped too, like with um, Key. But there's nothing more beautiful than when you are consuming it all, and then you hear like in the Lorna and Tempest Runner, you hear voice actors doing Key and Skier, and you're like, ah, because now you have like something to put in your ears instead of just what's on the page. So it's it's great puzzle pieces for people who can do it all. I, I like going back to the Tempest Runner. I loved that they did the audio drama and I, I hope they do more of those just because you're right, because you're giving instead of one person doing all the voices of everybody in the cast, um, as you get with the audio books, the here you actually have a lot of different people doing the voices and it, it works really well. Um, assuming that the voices are distinct enough for those of us who can't tell the difference. Right. Who's speaking now? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> that is, what are you, uh, do you think as someone who, um, do you think it's the whole initiative has been, do you think there could be something more they can do for people who might have hearing issues or um, is there any kind of audio drama that helps with that? Or do you think they're just doing what is industry standard? Uh well, pretty much like, um, have you ever listened to the the ra- the original radio dramas? Uh uh-uh. uh They do so. The radio dramas in general, audio dramas in general, do a lot of very weird things with dialogue because you need to specifically state state things where in books you don't like. I'm opening the door now, whereas like in books you could just say and so and so opened the door. Um, but since you don't generally have a narrator, I think it's a, it's a fine line between obnoxious and useful, uh, where you are, um, saying things like making sure that the, whoever's listening knows who's talking. Okay. And, and that, that's, that, that's kind of my biggest issue is like, sometimes the voices get merged together and I can't tell, like, I have a real problem with, uh, um, the higher pitched generally female voices because I, I can't hear a lot of those higher ranges. And so two, um, two higher pitched voices kind of send the same to me. And if you yeah. don't sp- d- explicitly state who is who, I don't know who's saying what. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's good to know. So. I think that that is all. Does anybody have uh, any last uh, comments or uh, things that they'd like to say? Drain gear forever. Yes. You have comics, Holly. You have to. I know. Is well, it I, two volumes? I started many moons ago um, a drain gear fabric print, and then I got distracted, and I have to go back to it. It'll be a good Halloween project this year. There you go. I do. I, 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 I understand. <laughs> I understand. Okay. I, like, I absolutely love the drinker. I think it was criminal, criminal what they did to them. <laughs> Are you a collaborator with the drinker? Do you have a pot in your garden somewhere that we need to be wary? <laughs> I feel like collab- collaborator is a negative term. Okay. Friend? <laughs> <laughs> I would just tell people to be gentle with themselves. It's a lot of content. But I always say the High Republic is an invitation because not everyone reads every genre. And if you take the time and take the invitation, you can read your first middle grade. You can read your first manga. You can read your first comic book. And so just be gentle with yourself and take your time. I think it's also like a good thing that to, to state that you don't have to read everything. If you find you are missing a story 
and you can easily, like you said, the 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 community is fantastic out there. Just say something like, "Where where did this happen? What happened to the Drangir? Exactly. Like, where can I find this story to look up? And then they have other people kind of direct you. So like, if you for some reason don't want or don't have time to read like the middle grade or the 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 young adult novels, like, oh, I like the Drangir. Where I find them? Well, they're in the the young adult novel. It's like, oh, okay. Then then you can kind of direct people in that direction. So it's it's you you can kind of pick and choose, but otherwise you will probably be missing stuff. But you can kind of figure out what you want to know along the way. All right. So, Kai. If you want someone to find you on the social medias, how can they go about doing that? I am at, at Yogi Kai across all platforms. So, and I'm usually talking about comics or High Republic or High Republic comics. Holly? Um, I am on Twitter as Surliest Girl and on Instagram as SurlyGirly5. Uh, if you want to follow Stuff You Missed in History class, that's at Missed in History everywhere. Uh, if you want to follow Criminalia, just use the hashtag Criminalia. And then Full of Sith is uh, at Full of Sith everywhere. Easy peasy. All right. And you can find us. You can email us, talkingtauntauns at aiptcomics.com. You can find us on Twitter at talkingtauntauns. You can join our Patreon and uh, come hang out with us on Discord through aiptcomics.com. And until... Um, Next week, I hope you have a good week. Don't laugh at I. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, you, you just she. Kai saw the wheels stop. <laughs> the hamster <laughs> fell off, and uh, it's like I don't know what I'm gonna say next. <ay <laughs> <laughs> for light and life. That's a good one. Yeah, for light and life. Yeah.